Good morning. Welcome to worship here at Crescent Avenue Presbyterian Church on this World Communion Sunday. We're actually going to have a little quiz this morning, and each of you will be asked a question on the microphone. So to begin, what I'd like us to do is take stock of what all the nationalities and the, and the heritage that we have here in our congregation this morning. So we're just going to go around the room, and we're going to ask you, what is your country of ancestry? So let's start with you, Darcy. West Africa. Puerto Rico. Okay, hold on. Okay, I'm coming. <coughs> Country of ancestry. Norwegian. Scottish. German and Irish. Ghana. Was that? Should have added Tobago. Sierra Leone. Germany. Ireland. Cameroon. Germany. Antigua. Dominica West Indies. Try that in Tobago. Wales. Germany, Austria. Jamaica. <laughs> Puerto Rico. Uh, on my father's side, it's, Scan uh, it's uh, Finnish, Lithuanian. On my mother's side, it's Slovakian and Austrian. French and German. British Isles. Did I forget anybody? Yes, okay. German, Scottish, English. Oh. <laughs> There's a whole bunch. African American. San Salvador, West Indies. Irish. Germany, French, Canadian. English and Armenian. German, Italian, and English. Armenian and Chilean. Thank you so much. What was our total? It is 21. 21. Well, and Slovakia, and English, and French, and, well, a little bit of everything. So, on my side. So, think about all the denominations, oh, no, all the nationalities that are gathered here for worship. You know, I think one of the most beautiful things about this congregation is that we hail from so many different places. But what unites us in worship and in faith is our Lord Jesus Christ, who loves all people for all times. Let us worship our God. Good morning. Good morning. Blessed World Communion Day. The headdress that I'm wearing today is called a mantilla, and it's adorned by many women of the Spanish colonies. Please rise if you are able for the call to worship. At the name of Jesus, every knee should bend, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Glory to God. Amen. The opening <laughs> hymn is, In Christ There Is No East or West, page 440.
And let us open our hearts and our presence to Christ our Lord. Let us pray. Lord, grant us a vision of the glories of your diverse creation. Forgive us when we fail to see the wonder of your creation and look upon your world in fear or distrust. When we fail to see the beauty in ourselves or in others, restore our vision. When we falter in our love for one another, teach us to love as you love. Grant us, O Lord, your hope and peace and cause us to rise up in faith, to live as you call us to live, to be the disciples you call us to be, to live lives of light that all the world may know your glory. Amen. Let us offer our silent prayers of confession. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ is a wondrous gift in our lives, a chance for grace and mercy, for forgiveness, for peace, for renewal, for restoration, for being reminded how loved we truly are and that in God's grace we truly are forgiven. The power of the gospel to transform our lives, to transform the world in Christ's name, It is a mighty gift to be shared in our own souls and with all of us in the world over. May the holy peace of Christ be with you all. And also with you. As brothers and sisters in Christ, we are called to share that peace one with another. Let us do so with joy (laughs) and thanksgiving. Today's Old Testament reading is Ezekiel 18, verse 1 through 4 and 25 through 32. The word of the Lord came to me. What do you mean by repeating this proverb concerning the land of Israel? The parents have eaten sour grapes and the children's teeth are set on edge. As I live, says the Lord God, This proverb shall no more be used by you in Israel. Know that all lives are mine. The life of the parent as well as the life of the child is mine. It is only the person who sins that shall die. Yet you say, the way of the Lord is unfair. Hear now, O house of Israel, is my way unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair, when the righteous turn away from their righteousness and commit iniquity? They shall die for it, for the iniquity that they have committed, they shall die. Again, when the wicked turn away from the wickedness they have committed and do with what is lawful and right, they shall save their life. 
because they considered and turned away from all the transgressions that they had committed. They shall surely live. They shall not die. Yet the house of Israel says, The way of the Lord is unfair. O house of Israel, are my ways unfair? Is it not your ways that are unfair? Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, all of you according to your ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions, otherwise iniquity will be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions that you have committed against me, and get yourselves a new heart and a new spirit. Why will you die, O house of Israel? For I have no pleasure in death of any one, says the Lord God. Turn then and live. Today's Psalter reading is Psalm 25, verses 1 through 9. The congregation will read the bold text. <coughs> to you, O Lord, I lift my soul. O my God, in you I trust. Do not let me be put to shame. Do not let my enemies exalt over me. Do not let those who wait for you be put to shame. Let them be ashamed who are wantonly treacherous. Make me to know your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Lead me in your truth and teach me. For you are the God of my salvation. For you I wait all day long. Be mindful of your mercy, O Lord, and of your steadfast love, for they have been from of old. Do not remember the sins of my youth or my transgressions. According to your steadfast love, remember me. For your goodness sake, O Lord. Good and upright is the Lord. Therefore he instructs sinners in the way. He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble in his way. Our New Testament reading is Philippians 2, verses 1 through 13. If then there is any encouragement in Christ, any consolation from love, any sharing in the Spirit, any compassion and sympathy, make my joy complete. Be of the same mind, having the same love, being in full accord and of one mind. Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility regard others as better than yourselves. Let each of you look not to your own interests, but to the interests of others. Let the same mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus who, though he was in the form of God, did not regard equality with God as something to be exploited, but emptied himself, taking the form of a slave, being born in human likeness, and being found in human form. He humbled himself and became obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Therefore, God also highly exalted him and gave him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus every knee should bend, in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord, to the glory of God the Father. Therefore, my beloved, just as you have always obeyed me, not only in my presence, but much more now in my absence. Work out your own salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who is at work in you, enabling you both to will and to work for his good pleasure. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Listen. 
said, Listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Jesus gave his mandate, share the good news that he came to save us and set us free. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Let none be forgotten throughout the world. In the triune name of God, go and baptize. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Help us to be faithful, standing steadfast, walking in your precepts, led by your word. Listen, listen, God is calling, through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, comfort, and joy. Listen, listen, God is calling, through the word inviting, offering forgiveness, Comfort and joy. Let us turn to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 21, verses 23 to 32, and let us listen for God's word for us today. When Jesus entered the temple, the chief priests and the elders of the people came to him as he was teaching and said, By what authority are you doing these things, and who gave you this authority? And Jesus said to them, I will also ask you a question. If you tell me the answer, then I will also tell you by what authority I do these things. Did the baptism of John come from heaven, or was it of human origin? And they argued with one another, if we say from heaven, he will say to us, why then did you not believe him? But if we say of human origin, we are afraid of the crowd, for all regard John as a prophet. So they answered Jesus, we don't know. And he said to them, neither will I tell you by what authority I am doing these things. But what do you think? <coughs> a man had two sons. He went to the first and said, son, go and work in the vineyard today. And he answered, I will not. But later he changed his mind and he went. The father went to the second and said to the same, and he answered, I go, sir, or Lord, in the translation. But he did not go. Which of the two did the will of his father? Well, they said, the first. And Jesus said to them, Truly I tell you, the tax collectors and the prostitutes are going into the kingdom of God ahead of you. For John came to you in the way of righteousness, and you did not believe him. But the tax collectors and the prostitutes believed him, and even after you saw it, you did not change your minds and believe them. This is the word of our Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to be God. God. Well, before our narrative begins, before we enter the story, Jesus has already entered Jerusalem on a donkey. There's been a crowd. It's a big, stressful time for those in charge. <laughs> He's not only entered into the temple, he's overturned the tables, he's cursed a fig tree, their landscaping is not faring very well and all of this. And you've got to give him some room for concern. You think about what the chief priests and elders are trying to deal with at the time. and Their question to him, by what authority do you do these things? Now in modern parlance it might sound more like, where do you get off acting like this? Or what the heck, dude? I guess depending on who your audience is. I think in one sense they're quite reserved in their questioning, right? Because these are the guys that are charged with keeping peace in town. 
They've already got a lot of people in the vicinity. There's a lot of activity that's happening, and they know that the Romans are looking very closely at them. They're ma trying to maintain this balance of power, right, between their leading families. There's some intermarriage with the Romans, and there's, there's just, they're trying to just keep things peaceful. So this Jesus comes along, and he seems less interested in all of that. Well, you can understand their fear and their concern. Because if this goes down, if a riot breaks out, a lot of people are going to get hurt. So they ask. They stand before Jesus, the Messiah, the Savior, and they ask him, where does your authority come from? Now, I have to say, I've pondered this question because in one sense, I want to say, well, why didn't you just say, it came from God, get in line, we're okay, you know, just stick with me. Why didn't he just answer them by what authority it came, right? It can be really clear. God would back them up, there wouldn't be an issue. But he doesn't answer them. He answers them with a question, a very rabbinic practice, right? Because it's not always about the final answer that you can be given, it's your openness and your willingness and your capability to hear the answer. And sometimes that cannot be approached dead on straight. Sometimes we're not ready to see things in a new light because of what? Fear, right? Our own ways of thinking because this is how it's gotten through us for the past 60, 70, 80, 90 years and you know, please don't mess with my world right now. I think I've got it set by now. But it's this fear, right, that blocks us sometimes from seeing how God sees. And this is what I think Jesus is trying to say to them. Because he holds up to them an example of a prophet. And many believed in John the Baptist. Right? Thousands went out for his baptism. And what was his baptism all about? It was about repentance, about changing your mind, changing your perspective, right? Being open to what God wants from you and not so much what the world wants. And yet they can't quite see it. In large part because their fear has defined their role in life. And they are so vested in this. And they, I think, I would imagine, would be very fearful that getting things wrong could go down very, very badly. Think about that for a moment. Jesus goes on to tell them a parable of two sons and asks which one did what the father asked. Now they quickly answer right? They're good Jewish folks. They know how this works. They can answer questions, right? But do they answer the question correctly? You see, the two sons that come before the father, and we're not foolish. We know what Jesus is talking about here. The father is God. The two sons is Israel. It's our relationship with God. So the first son that says, you know, no, I'm not going to go. He's rather belligerent. But then later, what? Repents and goes. And the other son, who's so, I mean, and, you know, from the translation, we, we miss it. It's like so, what is that word? Obsequious? You know, it's like, oh, saying to your father, oh, Lord of heaven, you know, of course I will go. And I can't imagine a father that's going to buy that at all, you know. And he doesn't go. <coughs> In essence, neither son gets it right. Neither did the will of the father. Sure, the, the, uh, the first one went out and he did the work, right? That was good. The second son, though he probably didn't mean it, offered the recognition for who the father is. But he failed the work. I think if you ponder this story and sit with it for a minute, and I'm afraid that many of the commentators just rush too quickly to an answer on this. And they say, well, it was the first son who actually went out and did things, and this must be the church, and, you know, the Jews have got it wrong, the Christians have got it right, and, you know, let's move on. I think the story is far deeper than that. 
Because I think it's a very human reaction to a very real threat. We often, as I said, struggle with changing the paradigm that we live with. We adopt either what's around us because it's easier, and sometimes we're afraid to speak out because either we feel we will be judged or ridiculed. Heaven knows you don't want to put anything on Facebook, and I don't advocate that. That is not the forum with which to debate issues. But we need to do it nonetheless. To struggle with the idea of, and the question of where God is in our life and in the world, and thus how we can better respond to him. Jesus, I think, is very compassionate in his sharing of the stories. He'll go on later on, this question of authority will come up over and over again. It's supposed to reorient ourselves spiritually that we do not become enamored or encased or locked in by the fears that the world will put upon us, but that we look at life in a different way through the lens of faith in Christ and in God. But this work of shifting a paradigm is one of the hardest things a human being can do. And think about that. Shifting a paradigm is one of the hardest things that people can do. <laughs> but if we don't shift, then somehow we miss the point of the story. We miss God's presence in our life. There is an author, a doctor by the name of David DeSalvo, who wrote an article, it's on Facebook, I'm not Facebook, it's on the internet, Eight Reasons Why It's So Hard to Really Change Your Behavior. He says, number one, we're motivated by negative emotions. And this I see over and over, not only in other people, I can see it in myself as well. He writes, while it's understandable to think that strongly felt negative emotions like regret, shame, fear, and guilt should be able to catalyze lasting behavior change, the opposite is actually true. Negative emotion just triggers more negative thinking and more negative behavior. The trick is to change the narrative. And this, I think, will be written on my gravestone. I'm not going to have one, but if it was, that would be Change the narrative. Listen to how you are speaking to yourself and what you're saying. What is it that you're focusing on? What is it that you're dwelling on? How is it that you really feel when there's nobody else around and you're not afraid that Alexa is going to record every conversation at home, which incidentally it is? How do you really feel about something? And then how you might shift that narrative 180 degrees. He goes on, he says, we get trapped by thinking fallacies, feeling overwhelmed by trying to change a behavior tends to foster an all-or-nothing thinking. I'm going to change and change, and if I fail, that means I can't do it. Oftentimes, we really struggle with the idea that if we want to think differently about something, anything, or make a behavior change, it could be something as simple as going on a diet, and you eat a donut, or two, or, well, we won't go into numbers there, but then you think, well, I failed, so I might as well give up. Change the narrative. If what you are invested in is understanding more about what God wants from you in your life, go back again. If what you're thinking is based on fear, then pray about it and work on it. Name what that fear is in your own life, and it will begin to lose power. Now, sometimes we can look at something we disagree with. I remember being in school, and I just really struggled with Islam. I just did. I couldn't seem to get my head wrapped around it. I read the Quran. It's organized by size of letters, not chronologically, just the clue, because that really threw me for a little bit. 
But so what I did was I went back and I wrote paper after paper on the subject. I can't say that I would ever convert to Islam. I won't. But at least gave me a deeper understanding of the faith so that I could move that dial a little bit closer to the center of Christ. But that takes intention and it takes work. But if what you really want to do is understand another person or how they believe, that's kind of what it takes. It won't happen instantaneously. It won't be a quick fix. There is nothing like learning about another culture or way of thinking than making a friend from that culture. Then, when you connect with somebody who doesn't think or look or believe like you, but you truly like them, all of a sudden you're more open to what they have to say and how they see things. I was, for a time, good friends with a Hindu woman. We have since they moved away, and, you know, whatever. But we used to walk every day. And I remember her talking about of festivals and the festival of light. And of course, then I talk about the light of Christ and we talked about how light comes into our life. Will she become Christian? Probably not. Will I become Hindu? Absolutely not. But could we be with each other as human beings, as God's children in a larger context? Absolutely. He goes on to say, we try to eat the entire elephant all at once. He said, behavior change is a big thing, no matter the behavior, and it's almost never possible to take all of it in at once. Again, this will not be a quick fix or a quick change. I think sometimes when we push an agenda too fast and too quickly, it might be right, but if people aren't open and able to hear it, all it will do is increase the fear and the anger and the dissension. It's easy for us, isn't it? It's our first initial reaction. We protect what is our own. But that isn't what Christ is calling us to hear. That isn't what he's standing before the chief priests and the elders of the church. That isn't what he's asking them to see. He wants them to see that nobody in the end gets it all right. And I think just at that point that we feel like we just know it all and we are all that and a bag of chips, we should know, wait a minute, let me back off. Because that's a dangerous place to be. And I was thinking about the tax collectors and the prostitutes. You know, they had their agendas too. They were in it for money, right? Let's be honest, that's what it's all about. But they're, the reason they are entering into heaven faster isn't because they're without sin. And Jesus wants to emphasize that. But those who came out to see John and saw within his preaching and his teaching the light of Christ or God, the, the idea of repentance, of changing, of the ability to change, that is what they found powerful and that's what turned their life around. But think about that narrative that John is sharing with the tax collectors and the prostitutes and all the folks on the streets and all those who aren't rich and famous and glorious and beautiful, and all those who feel that they might be on the margin, John is saying to them, God loves you and has a different story for you than what the world might write on you. That, I think, is a wonderful gift, a powerful message. And if we embrace that message that John was preaching and that Jesus is emphasizing, and will go to the cross and lay down his very life as sacrifice that we might have grace and forgiveness and an opening into it life we never would have had otherwise. All of that, all of that should remind us how deeply loved we truly are and that in God's grace and mercy, 
He wants us to quiet our fears. Don't be defined by what's on the evening news. Don't fall prey to everything that's on Facebook. But listen to yourself and to others. To calm your fears, to name them and put them behind you, just for a moment. And open yourself to God's presence and say, Lord, teach me your way, that I might know the way, and that in your way, I may experience life and understanding more abundantly, more fully, more lovingly, and more peacefully. This is what I think Jesus wants for those chief priests, for the elders, for all the people that were standing before him, for all those that were listening behind as well. One other writer writes, again, it is more likely that we will feel negative emotions when bad things occur. This is a given. We recognize in our world today, there is a lot of bad stuff that's happening. However, it is up to us to take inventory and be cognizant of our beliefs so that they do not lead to unhealthy negative emotions and block us from appreciating what we have. What we have is our belief in God, the love that he holds for us, the truth that he carries before us and longs for us to hear. Think about the other readings that we read this morning. They impact this story in a powerful way. They impact our own spiritual growth in a powerful way. God does not care whether we're black or white or yellow or any kind of color. He does not care what country we necessarily come from. Those nations, all as wonderful as they all are, are <laughs> of human construct. What he does want us to hear in this World Communion Sunday, that we are one in faith, that every single one of us is truly and deeply loved and treasured and have a story and a life, that we were created for a certain purpose, a purpose that's glorious, and maybe we cannot see it in its fullness right now, but that is where faith comes in. And that if we lean in more closely one to another, take a little more time to listen, to learn, our world will be changed in an amazing way because we will draw closer to God's kingdom being built here today, now. I thank you for coming on this World Communion Sunday. I thank you for sharing all the places of your origin. I apologize to Bonnie because I did not ask. So what country are you from, Bonnie? Germany. Ger Germany and England. Germany and England. You know, you just look at our diversity and you realize what a gift that truly is. How this small community of faith truly reflects God's kingdom here on earth. May we act like it. In the name of Jesus Christ, we pray, and all his disciples said, Amen.
faith using the words of the Nicene Creed as we proclaim. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, life from life, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. For our sake, he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day, he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who receives the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. You may be seated. Good morning, church. Good morning, I, I think you all may know that um, my one of my many vocations is that I am a psychotherapist um, by trade. I'm licensed in the state of New Jersey as well as Pennsylvania. But as I'm sitting up here listening to Pastor preach and she slays the cognitive behavioral therapy theory, I was thinking, man, I could have saved all that money and just learned under Pastor Lynn. Pastor Lynn, she presented to you the basis of cognitive behavioral therapy. Your thoughts guide your feelings, your feelings impact your behavior, and your behavior changes circumstances and situations. I think about that in the context of our offering. When I think about the Lord and all he has done for me, the feeling I get inside is joy, unspeakable joy. That joy then leads me to a giving spirit. And that giving that we can do now in worship has the ability to change circumstances and situations for this community. Let us now prepare our hearts and minds, not only to receive this psychotherapy, but to give our offering. <clears throat> Oh. 
Amen. Congregation, as you are able, would you rise and stand to your feet? submission to who you are, God all by yourself. Lord, we ask that you continue to guide our thoughts. May our thoughts meditate on you daily, day in and night. May we be forever reminded of the feeling of unspeakable joy that you provide to us. May our behavior be consistent <laughs> and pleasing in your sight. And when it is all said and done, may we watch those things change society, and the behaviors that we see in the community. Now, Lord, we ask that you would bless this offering, multiply it, allow it to be utilized for the further building of your kingdom on this side of glory. When it is all said and done, we'll be forever mindful to give you all the praise, glory, and honor. It is in the strong name of Jesus we all pray. Amen. You may be seated. A couple of announcements. First of all, thank you to everyone who came out and had cake and bought cake. We actually raised three hundred and fifty-six dollars uh, for the recording, the cost for recording. Um, so thank you so much for everybody who came out and supported the event. Thank you to Wendy Reed who organized and led the event on behalf of membership and evangelism and worship and music wanted to extend their appreciation uh, for the support as well. So thank you everybody. Um, well done, well done. Uh, the congregation is cordially invited to witness and celebrate the marriage of Laura Elizabeth Mann. I did not know your middle name before. So Laura's getting married on Friday. She is on uh, Saturday. She's one of our own. It's going to be here at 4 o'clock. It's going to be glorious. How wonderful to celebrate uh, a marriage, a union of two souls. They're such a lovely couple. So they are inviting you to come out and witness their marriage again, 4 o'clock this coming Saturday. We hope that you will join us. And I wanted to bring attention to October 22nd, which is the blessing of the animals. If you have something with fur or fins or scales, not including, including partner, uh, spouses or partners, but like to bring them in for a blessing, that would be awesome. So we hope that you'll bring in your furry friends and, you know, or invite a friend to come along with you that has a pet that they might like to have blessed. So let's see how many critters we can get in here and in God's kingdom and offer them a blessing. So that will be October 22nd. Let us continue in worship. I often think of the Lord as he was preparing the table that night for dinner, looking around at his friends, knowing full well what was about to happen and what was to come. <laughs> the great love he must have had and still holds for us who comes to this table. For time is only what blocks us from that event as we celebrate the communion this holy sacrament, we do so, for this is our Lord's table. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God, for they will come from the east and west and from north and south and sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took the bread and he blessed and he broke it. And he gave it to them and their eyes were opened and they recognized him. This is the Lord's table. Our Savior invites those who trust in him 
to share the feast which he has prepared. The Lord be with you. Lift up your heart. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is our greatest joy to give you thanks and praise, for you looked upon all you, that your hands had wrought and called it good. You smiled upon purple mountains soaring above wildflower plains. You sent clouds scuttling across reflective waters and set stars to wink upon the earth in deep, <laughs> knowing delight. Despite your created goodness, we use our freedom for ourselves alone without regard for your intentions for all. Still, you pursue us to save us from sin's harm, freeing us from slavery to give us a new world flowing with milk and honey. When we chase after other gods, you call us back to you through cries of prophets, which we ignore, until at last you sent your own child to be for us the goodness we refuse. Therefore, we praise you, joining our voices with the celestial choirs and with all the faithful of every time and place who forever sing to the glory of your name. for coming to us as a little child to live baptized in the midst of our fallen world. Embodying God's desire to bless all people, you spoke peace to a war-mongering empire and were blessed to be a blessing to all people. When threatened with the terror of crucifixion, you did not keep silent but stood up and overcame evil in the resurrection to new life, to turn the bread of human affliction into manna from heaven, and to turn the bitter dregs of sin into the cup of joyful celebration. Remembering all your mighty and merciful acts, we take this bread and this wine from the gifts that you have given us and celebrate with joy the redemption won for us in Jesus Christ. Accept this, our sacrifice of praise and thanksgiving, as a living and holy offering of ourselves, that our lives may proclaim the one crucified and risen. Praise be you, Holy Spirit, blowing through time to enliven your people, the church, to live as Christ's body, in God's ministry of repairing our broken world. Come, hover over us anew with your bright, bright brooding wings in the breaking of bread and in the celebration of this cup, that our eyes may be open to recognize Christ among us and in all who share in this feast. Knit us more closely together in the fellowship of your sovereign way. We offer ourselves, our lives, our resources to be your hands reaching into the world with your unfathomable compassion. Fill us like breath fills flutes to be instruments of your peace. Where there is lack of regard for your creation, prod us to speak up. Where people fail to see the dignity of all persons, open blind eyes. Where there is silence about others being hurt, impassion us with a desire for justice. Lord, your creation groans under abuse. Renew the earth with goodness. Your children are starving across the globe. To those who hunger, give bread, and to those who have bread, give hunger for justice. To the sick who suffer, heal their hurts in body, mind, and spirit. For all those we name in our hearts and lift before you, hear our prayer. All glory and honor are yours, Almighty Father, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. together in the prayer that our Savior taught us to pray, saying, 
our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. The Lord Jesus, on the night of his arrest, took bread, and after giving thanks to God, he blessed and he broke it, and he gave it to them, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This cup is a new covenant sealed in my blood, shed for you for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink of it, do so in remembrance of me. And so whenever we eat this bread or drink this cup, we proclaim the saving death of our risen Lord until he comes again. These are the gifts of God for the people of God.
the blood of Christ, the cup of salvation. Let us pray. Holy Triune God, we thank you for this meal that proclaims the peace and healing of the nations. We thank you for this meal where little is enough to change our lives, where little is more than enough to feed those whose hearts yearn for communion and community. May this bread and the fruit of the vine nourish us so that we may grow in faith and knowledge that in you we truly are one. Amen. And we will sing this hymn twice. go from here as the beloved children of God because that is truly who you are. Honor and recognize the heritage of, heritage of your ancestors and all that brings to your story today. But make that story one that helps to build a world of peace and hope and grace and love for all people. We we'll all stand before each other in recognition and respect and honor and love and grace. Go out and shine the light of Christ to everyone that you meet especially the stranger, that they might know that God loves them as well. And I pray that the Lord will bless you and keep you, that will cause his face to shine brightly upon you, and that he fill you with the gifts of the Holy Spirit. In the name of Jesus Christ, may it be so, and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.